we had some audio some audio issues <laughs> unfortunately but we made it through right richard right yeah, we, we're professionals <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> we made we made it through uh but yeah if you guys uh, have missed that episode make sure you guys watch that as well because we do go over uh the amazing work and legacy of richard norton today we're going to have some fun, and we didn't get a chance to do it last time because, you know, time constraints, but today we're going to focus a little bit more on Richard's uh, legacy of being a trainer, a fight coordinator, a fight choreographer, and all that fun stuff because we didn't get a chance to really deep dive into that world uh, of Richard, and and it, what perfect opportunity to do that with this year, one of my favorite movies of this year, The Suicide Squad. It is so much fun. It is a blast. Me and my wife loved it. It scratched the itch. It was funny. <laughs> it had heart. It was violent. Y'all know I like violent action movies. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like movies with balls, okay? I'm sorry. All right? I like it. It's fun. Uh, but it was badass. It was a lot of fun. And we we rated it really high here, uh, Richard. We gave it a 4.5 out of 5 here. Like, we enjoyed the hell out of the Suicide Squad movie that came out this year. So... Uh, before we lead up, oh, go ahead, Richard. Is that a good score from you guys? Are you normally a lot more brutal on, <laughs> on movies? <laughs> well, four four point five out of five is pretty high. That's high for us. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. We loved it, man. We loved it. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and just kind of have some fun, just briefly, just for fun. Let's just talk about your experiences with a few other projects before we lead up to the big one. Here for Suicide Squad, uh, but first of all, we got Mr. Tony of the Dead, actor himself, and uh, movie lover, martial arts and action, and post-apocalyptic uh, movie lover, hanging out with mm. us today. Thanks, Tony, for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Like, this is an honor to be here with R Mr. Richard Norton. Like, <laughs> damn, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm honored to be with anybody that calls himself Tony of the Dead. <laughs> Oh, 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 look at that. <laughs> I see your little description in front of your, your face there, Mr. Tony of the Dead. I said, okay. That's it. That's it. He loves his, he loves his horror. But, uh, of course, like I mentioned before last time Richard was on here, I became a huge fan of his just amazing martial arts fights against Sammo Hung, Jackie Chan. I mean, the list goes on. Cynthia Rothrock, Millionaire's Express. Uh, you know, just there's so many classic movies that Richard's been in, and I just became a huge fan of his work uh, through, the, through, the, through the Hong Kong cinema, and of course, you know, the Rage and Honor films over here as well. Tony, how did you discover Richard and, and become a fan? Um, I have a segment that uh, on my channel called Wasteland Wednesdays, and the first um, movie I saw was Equalizer 2000. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah. I was blown away by that movie, that gun like the, the everything like samurai and i were just like oh my god this is so good and like just uh you know hey hey you know tony that you know that gun there was a filipino armorer actually made that and you know the rocket launcher actually worked the armor light worked and the shotgun worked so <laughs> what you're looking at normally it'll look like a movie prop the, the thing would actually do what it was supposed to do which is <laughs> incredible do you it's... still do you have that gun no i don't no <laughs> <laughs> I'd be looking at it behind bars if I did. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. so so you you don't have it. I got it. No. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, we we were. Yeah, see, I already knew you when we reviewed that movie. But Tony was like, "Who is this alpha male? Like, this guy is like, <laughs> this is you know, we're we're just gonna leave. You know, screw this. You know, we're, you know, I'm all fat. You know." Just <laughs> Like, look at this! Look at this! Look at this! This this stud here, like this alpha male representation right here. But yeah, we mm -hmm. became Tony became huge fans, and then we, we had fun watching the other uh, post apocalyptic films as well. Uh, but then I've started to show Tony a lot more of your martial arts movies now, so he's even a bigger fan. So uh, you know, the, we're spreading the love. We're spreading the love. Speaking yeah. of spreading the love, uh, in terms of martial arts appreciation. Um, just really quick, uh, Richard, what did you think of, uh, one of the greatest fighters of all time, martial artists of all time? What do you think about Anderson Silva's success, uh, in, uh, crossing over to boxing? Well, 
It, no surprises for me. You know, uh, first of all, I, you know, when I met Anderson, did a seminar, hence that photo out here in Australia. And the, the, the thing that impressed me most, besides from his obvious ability, is what a nice man he is. Mm. He was so unbelievably humble and respectful. You know, he, he kind of knew a little bit about me. I mean, you know, I don't expect any reverence from someone like Anderson, you know, who's just the top of the heap. But it was just refreshing that, for me, he endowed those old school martial arts ethics, you know, humility, respect, you know, integrity. And and so I, I became a fan, of, well, more so after meeting with him, because I, you know, I've always said that, you know, with martial arts, it's not the two hours on the mat, it's the 22 two hours off the mat. Mm. Or you might say it's not the five rounds in the ring or whatever. And it's how people are as human beings and how they interact with others. And I, I'm just, I'm so happy when I meet somebody with Anderson's skill set and see that he still holds that old school integrity. And uh, so getting back to the fight, I mean, I, you know, did you, did you see how controlled he was? I mean, all he yeah. did was cover up, he bobbed and weaved. It was beautiful, you know, and, and you watch the way he punches, you know, even that right hook that first connected Tito and then that left hand and finish him. It almost looks like just, but it's just, there's there's no real apparent effort. It's not like somebody bursting, you know, veins coming out of their necks. Right. He's just an artist, you know, he's relaxed. It reminded me a little bit of the way of uh, Muhammad Ali when he used to throw a jab. You never yeah. saw him like this. It was the pop, you know, he'd flip that punch out and people would go down. So, uh, again, no surprises whatsoever. I, I'm not a big fan of those sort of fights anymore, you know. I'm, I'm not sure. Look, it's a public spectacle, and obviously people tune in to see it, but I don't know. I, I'm not so keen on seeing 50-year-olds and older getting in the ring, you know, now at this right. stage. I mean, look right. at, um, you know, the boxing match with uh, Vito you know, in Holyfield. I mean, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> I don't want to see that. Holyfield's a legend, you know. Right. And he took the fight with very little notice. He's 59 years of age, which, by the way, doesn't mean that he wouldn't be an absolute machine still in the oh, ring. Yeah. But it's just not something I want to see. And it's not its not the way I want to remember someone like Holyfield. That's, right. that's all I have to say about right. that. Mm. Yeah, copy that. Uh, but I just wanted to bring that up because... It was seeing fun. It was fun seeing <laughs> Silva knock out Tito, and uh, <laughs> I loved how afterwards, you know, when they, when they interviewed Anderson Silva, he said, he, you know, he just this is a dedication to martial arts, Wing Chun, and Bruce Lee, and yeah. I was like, look at this guy. This is awesome. So yeah. I just wanted to share that with you, Richard. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. It was nice when he said, you know, you, you know, like Bruce Lee used to say, just be like water, you know, and he said. Yeah. Exactly. And he kind of did, didn't he? He just went with the flow. He didn't get excited. He didn't panic. He just knew he could bob and weave and survive in the pocket. And then when the time was right, which is just exactly what happened. So that was nice. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was poetry in motion. All right. So uh, before we get into just a few projects, uh, before we get into su the Suicide Squad. So uh, you've trained with many stars and actors, uh, training them and, and getting them ready for their movies. How was it working with uh, Scarlett Johansson? <laughs> uh, Scarlett, she's a gem. You know, I, I just absolutely love her to death. We, uh, I was sent to New York to train her um, for Ghost in the Shell. And it was supposed to be, you know, I forget how long we're in New York, which, by the way, was a phenomenal experience. Um, nice. Scarlett is totally committed. You know, she's funny. She's funny as all hell. <laughs> very, very smart. A very kind of uh, warped sense of humor, which <clears throat> suits me down to a T, you know, because I'm kind of the same. So we, we just got to, we established a very good friendship along with the training. But again, nice. she would turn up every time. She would be on time and she'd be totally committed. So I always love that. I love it when you get an artist or anybody that, you're supposed to train that's there because they want to be there, not there because they've been told to be there. You know what I mean? You can right. tell the way somebody listens, the way they pay attention, the effort they put in as to whether they really want to do it or they're just going through the kind of the numbers. But I ended up, I was in New York and then we went to Los Angeles. I was there for a while with her in Los Angeles. And I, w I wasn't the fight coordinator on Ghost in the Shell. That was Timmy Wong, you know, a friend of ours who's stunt coordinator. 
from New Zealand. And um, so my job was really to teach Scarlett all the tools <clears throat> that I figured she would need as that character in Ghost in the Shell. <clears throat> because at that stage, the choreography is not figured out. So, right. you know, again, I just have to explain what well, this is a punch, this is a back fist, this is a back kick, you know, whatever it might be that I think that character the skill set or the toolbox that she would need as that character. And that's what I did in New York and LA. And then gradually when you get to New Zealand, I was there really to look after and make sure, you know, she looked on in camera and everything else and keep her polished up. And she just did amazing. I mean, she's, you know, I, I can't say enough about Scarlett. Nice. Nice. How fun is that? And, uh, also here in the next movie, which a lot of fans could still consider to this day, uh, Steve Austin's best movie. They still consider this his best movie, and is and it's still up to this day. They're like, no, the Condemned is the best, man. Uh, how was it working uh, with these guys? Uh, they were, we had so much fun, you know. See, Steve Austin, <clears throat> as everybody knows, is you know such an icon of the WWE, the wrestling. Um, I remember the director Rick Jacobson wanted me to focus on Steve as anything but a wrestler he said i just i don't want him to look like he's in a world championship wrestling ring and uh as funny as it sounds you might think that's easy and it's not when you look at the style of action that steve's known for in the ring and you have to transform him you know so i had to work a lot on footwork um you know how to move how to throw a punch how to make a punch work for camera but Again, it's it's not difficult with an athlete like Steve. Yes, he's good at one area, and it's new for him to be throwing punches and look a little bit like a close quarters combat sort of dude. Yeah. But because they understand their bodies and physicality and everything else, and particularly how to put on a show, which is what you're doing when you're making a movie, <clears throat> then the leap's not that great. And um, he he was great, you know, and again... We used to work out with weights, you know, we would hang out and uh, it was a good experience. The other one was uh, Vinnie Jones, who everybody knows from Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just on the far left of the screen you're looking at. And Vinnie was a trip, man. I ended up being, uh, I was a fight coordinator, ended up being Vinnie's uh, fight double. So oh. I was playing Vinnie in a lot of the fight action. And once again, when, you know, and I had Sam Greco doubled uh, Steve. Austin, Stam is a friend of mine who was world Kyokushin champion. Oh. Um, yeah, he was an a, a MMA fighter. He's also a K1 world champion. I mean, this guy's Ooh. a moose. So once we all got together, that was the end of it. It was a nonstop <laughs> practical jokes from the day <laughs> one. I mean, it was ridiculous. And we, we just had some funny times. You know, I remember I'm, I'm supposed to be doubling Vinny and I'm chasing supposedly uh steve austin you know over these rocks that are at waterfall you know this is up in queensland so you know i'm chasing sam and they had a camera overhead on a wire and there was no sound you know it was wasn't obviously sync sound because the mic couldn't follow us and i'm just having a ball and i'm chasing after sam on camera and i'm screaming at him say you fat fuck you better run you know look at your ass it's jiggling around when i catch <laughs> I'm just saying the most atrocious stuff while Sam's running, you know, and we're chasing him up and we finally, we get to the top and we hear cut. When I look up to my right, I mean, it was really quite profane, but you know, guys get together and I look up and there's a mum and a dad and two kids on this little walkway because it's like a public park, you know? Yeah. And I look up and I see them just looking at me. And I was like, oh my God. And I look up and said, oh, um, but it's just a movie, you know. I felt so embarrassed with some of the things that was setting me up. But anyway, it was just we just we just had such a such a good time, you know. Vinnie Jones is great, you know. He's he's funny. I mean, he would sneak into Stone Cold's trailer, you know, and put cellophane over the toilet seat, you know. <laughs> he would wander in and take a pee, and it splash all over him, and it was oh. real. Good. Oh, oh, that's hilarious. Schoolyard kind of pranks and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fun. What what fun. And and of course, you got this big guy. How was it working with Nathan Jones? 
Uh, Nathan's great. Well, I, I've known Nathan for a long time. Uh, as you know, Nathan's what close on six foot eleven. Wow. You know, he, and, it, but he's 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 a big man child, and I say that meaning he's the loveliest guy as well. He loves home computer video games. He's got his house set up with speakers everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's was everything. I don't know why I say that. Why wouldn't somebody the six foot eleven, the size of Nathan, be sitting there enjoying video games? But it's not <laughs> the image that I had. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, he was fantastic. He's another an amazing athlete, as you know. He was in uh, Fury, you know, in uh, Fury Road. Mad oh yeah. I uh, did a phenomenal job on that. Nathan's living in Thailand at the moment. Um, oh, all right. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. And he, again. The great thing, you know, as a fight coordinator is you don't know what you're going to get with people when you start to put them together with an actor. There's, there's a big trepidation about safety, you know, and does this person have control? But the thing I loved about Nathan, he couldn't have been more concerned about abusing his strengths, you know? If he grabbed somebody in a guillotine hole or whatever it was, he was well aware of his power. And I just loved that he was very, very aware and sympathetic the fact that he had to be very careful because he's just a big man of <laughs> course he's always stone cold but you know what i'm saying i mean there's plenty of opportunity for people to get injured when you get adrenalized even within a fight scene right i might realize but you it's all it's not unlike being in a real fight because you're you're going maximum you want to look the best you can be you want to look the strongest you can be so there's every chance that that can get a little out of whack, you know. And, right. um, but anyway, with those guys, it was no problem at all. So very happy. Copy that. That's really awesome. Those are fun stories. That's hilarious. And, you know, Nathan Nathan was in the world's strongest man competition. You know, he was oh, an okay. I mean, I mean, this guy's the real deal, you know. He's not just somebody that's pumped up and big. That guy is unbelievably powerful. In fact, I've got you a funny story when we were – sitting around and I hadn't, you know, really met Nathan to speak with, you know, during the film and we're standing around and Stone Cold was there, Vinnie Jones is there and we're talking about a particular sequence where I'm saying, look, Nathan here, I'm going to get to grab you in a guillotine choke, you know, and I was trying to explain the escape and everything. Nathan's like standing back and he's very quiet, you know, because Nathan's very softly spoken and he'd stand back and all the lads are standing at stunt doubles and the actors standing and suddenly it's like Nathan switched and he gets this idea as the character. He suddenly, he goes from this gentle person, you know, and he says, yeah, and he says, and I can suddenly, oh, fucking hit him with a big hammer fist. I'll be like a big fucking silverback gorilla. And <laughs> this change, you know, and it was almost like going into a wrestling mode, you know, when you see the wrestlers. Yeah. And it's like Stone Cold. And did they all kind of took a step back? And like, what the fuck, you know? It was just very funny. And then he, he grabs me. He, he wanted to show me the understood a guillotine hole, which for those who don't know, it's, you bend over, you put the arm around the bottom of the neck. It's a choke. But he actually lifts me up. Oh. So my body is vertically straight up in there and kind of rests me, my shoulder on his shoulder. And I'm up there and they're all looking and I just softly said, Nathan, put me down. <laughs> <laughs> he lets me down. Oh, are you okay? He said, I just get a little excited, you know. <laughs> oh, Imagine Somebody that tall, I'm talking to you, and I felt like a toothpick. You know, I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh, how funny! How funny is that? <laughs> yeah, I've heard from other people that he's just like the sweetest guy. You know, he's yeah, like really he, nice. He can do the splits. You know, when we were oh my god for another movie. You know, I remember. You know, you have those big, big leather kind of they stand alone punching bags. They've got a big bottom. You know, like that sort of stuff and. I said to Nathan, he, Nathan, can you throw a spinning like back kick, you know? I could hardly spun, you know, and hit this thing. I mean, I, I just was like, oh, my God. I said, imagine getting hit with that. And the guy is incredibly talented, Man. you know, uh, as, as a fighter. So you got size and strength, one of the most powerful guys in the world, and he knows how to punch and kick. So that's not a good combination. To <laughs> <laughs> Copy that. Nice. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, Triple Frontier. How was it working on the set with these gentlemen? Oh, that was wonderful. Um, look, what a great cast. I know. know. 
I, I just had so much fun. Charlie Hunnam and I became such close friends. Charlie's actually in Australia. Well, he's in Thailand now, but he was here uh, shooting Shantaram, which is a, a novel that's been made into a television, Netflix television series. Hmm. So we've been hanging out. That was taken, by the way, in Hawaii. That's from the gentleman from uh, Hawaii Five-O, who loves jiu-jitsu. Nice. So we, so we were, I was training, just doing classes in jiu-jitsu while we're ju- shooting Triple Frontier in Hawaii. Um, and Charlie, Charlie, by the way, is he's, he's, he's hooked on jiu-jitsu now, you know. He's a, he's a purple belt level. He nice. loves training. Uh, as I said, he, he's coming back to Melbourne at the end of this month, so we'll get to hang out again. He's a very, um, he's very spiritual, Charlie, you know. He loves yoga. He's, he's just, again, a really, really nice human being. And, and, man, his career is going through the roof at the moment. You know, he's now producing his own movies, getting his own scripts and everything else going and, and just a fantastic actor. Um, ben Affleck, of course, Triple Frontier, you know, Oscar Isaac. I mean, it was a wonderful cast um, that we had on that and shooting in Hawaii was great. You know, it was hard, you know, because you're kind of out in the jungles and everything else. There was some good action in there. The, the just disappointing thing for me with uh, Triple Frontier is we had a a fight, you know, a huge fight um, with Headland, you know, as the actor, he, he has an MMA match and we actually got an MMA fighter that lived in Hawaii to come in. I worked with him on the choreography and boy, it turned out so well. Uh, Garrett Headland, you know, was, was fighting and trained him up. It was such an amazing fight and for whatever reasons got completely cut out oh. of the show. Mm which yeah. Garrett was devastated because he did work so hard on that. And it's not like it didn't look good. I mean, sometimes I don't care whether I choreograph him or somebody else. You look at him and you go, well, that shit, you know, that shouldn't stay in. But, you know, this this particular fight and Garrett's effort in that, and I forget, unfortunately, you know, the, the uh, MMA fighter that we got who was wonderful to work with. But anyway, they did a phenomenal job. Um, so it's a chance to do that as well as do close quarters combat, a lot of gun work and everything like that, of course, uh, right. involved. But, but Charlie, but, Charlie's hooked. He's hooked on that jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he loves it because I started training him early on before Triple Frontier in Los Angeles. You know, Higan Machado, one of my jiu-jitsu coaches, has a, a Beverly Hills Academy. And so we agreed to meet there and I started training Charlie. Um, not just in jiu-jitsu, but punching, kicking, and everything else. Although he's al- he already was quite, you know, knowledgeable in all those areas. But, yeah, he just loves it. And we, uh, as I said, we've set up a good friendship. And he's, you know, he texted me a little while ago, can't wait to get back on the mat when he gets back to Melbourne. So, <laughs> you know, the nice thing about movies for me is, yes, they're a job. And, you know, you're there for two months, three months, six months, whatever it might be. And a lot of times, it's like a little space capsule. Well, you know, everybody's in this capsule. You finish the job and everybody wants to stay in contact. But it doesn't often happen. Like, people just get on with their lives. But when you do get friendships like this one with Charlie, that becomes a genuine friendship outside of the work um, mode and everything, I, yeah. I, that's really rewarding for me. You know, that's, 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 it's just great to have that. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, ho- over here, we have some fans here. Uh, AJ Mason, <clears throat> excuse me, AJ Mason, Marco G, Bruce Leeds, Will Thorburn, everyone's saying hello to the legend, Richard Norton, everyone's saying hi over here. <laughs> Just Thank you. Appreciate point that it. out. And I have to highlight this one from Eric. Uh huh. Painful. Painful. <laughs> <laughs> T shirts made up with paint. I'm telling you, you got to do it, Richard. I would buy it. I would buy it. I'm telling you, I would buy it. I would represent it, though. Uh, I I remember, I mean, obviously, that that was a Sammo Hong thing, you know, when I was fighting Sammo and Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. And remember again that, you know, when I do those, they would just want me to come up with some English dialogue that was equivalent to the length of the dialogue they would be putting in in Mandarin or Cantonese. There was never any onset sound or sync sound. 
they would always dub it after the fact. So I, I'm trying to remember whether that came from Samo. It wouldn't surprise me or whether I came up with it. I really don't know. But the idea, I say, you know, you painful. And he says, no, no, no. And he's rubbing. He basically says, I'm not hurting because my body's all numb, you know. And <laughs> it's a very typical Samo sort of humor. But it became a bit of a catchphrase, you know, because later on in the fight, I sort of say, how about now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This yeah, is yeah. great. Classic moment. Everybody loves that. It's just, it's just too good. It's just, it's just too good. So before we get to the most recent Suicide Squad, you were actually involved with the first uh, Suicide Squad movie. What was your involvement here besides, uh, did you train, had to train some of the actors here? Yeah, no, I was fight coordinator. Again, okay. um, so my job was to choreograph fights and train the actors, get them ready, you know, teach them the choreography, of course, and, and get them to look good on camera. By the way, you know, very, very importantly, what I want to say is that the job I do, you know, on these movies, it's not, I would love to sit here and say, oh, it's all me, you know, it's not, you know, we, we have a team, you know, a guy Norris I work for, I've worked with Guy for over 30 years now, he's a legendary second unit director, stunt coordinator, he's been involved in some of the biggest productions, and it's, he's just, he's fantastic to work with, you know, because he's, he's a guide. You know what I mean? We have Timmy Wong, as I mentioned earlier, is a New Zealand coordinator who works on a lot of these shoots now with us. We just have great riggers, Mick Rowan, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's just a great team of stunties that you trust that are all there to give input. You know what I mean? Sure, I've got to come up with, with a certain theme and the crux of it, but what I've learned to do on this job is to be very open to any suggestion that anyone might have. I, I hate a set where, say, the coordinator is like, oh, well, it's not a, my idea, then we're not going to use it. Mm. You know, get rid of that ego bullshit because I always say, I don't care whose idea it is, if it's good and it works on the end result, on camera, on screen, then everybody wins, you know? Yeah. It's a right. thing. So, Again, I, I just want to be careful to point out how what, a, what an incredible team, you know, that I have working around me to help me do the job that I'm doing. So Nice, nice. So shout out and props to the team as well. Yeah, yeah. so the first Suicide Squad was, was fantastic. David Ayer, of course. The only, I, I want to say the only disappointing thing for me is I, I agree with all the post-press, even from David, that the, the, the result that you saw on screen wasn't the movie that David Ayer made. Right. I mean, they wrote it and directed it, but there was a lot of studio. Um, mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say interference because I'll get in the trouble, you know, but it was a lot of <laughs> studio involvement right. that ended right. up with the cut that ended up on screen. And I didn't say that because I was there. I saw some of the drama between the Joker and Harley Quinn that was cut out. There were a lot of things that were absolutely omitted from that move that I believe would have changed the overall impression of that film. Um, but there you go. You know, that happens. I would Look, love I, to see a David Ayer cut. Yeah. I would yeah, love well, for that to talk, happen. You know, yeah, a lot of people wanting it, and there was talk of it doing, I guess, I don't know what the what would stop it. Maybe it's quite expensive to do that. I'm not really Probably. sure. But there were a lot of interesting scenes the director's cut, you know, to see what David Ayer was talking about when he right. says that, that wasn't, you know, the movie that, that he actually made. Right. But listen, uh, you know, once again, what, what a privilege. I got to train Will Smith at his house for, for months before that shoot. There he is. I mean, what an incredible human being Will is. He's he's just such a, a – I feel like I'm being over the top now just calling everybody such good people, but – I would tell you if they're assholes. <laughs> really, <laughs> would, I've met some of those too. But Will, you know, even during to give an example, Will spent two or three hundred thousand dollars of his own money to get equipment and build a gym in the studio with, that we're working in in wow. Canada, just so all the staff and crew and and actors would have a place to work out because. He said to me, he said, I want making a film, especially if he's involved, to be a life experience, not just be to make a movie. And he was the team leader. I mean, one of the producers said to me, he said, he's never seen a cast pulled together so much. And he actually, he credited Will with being that alpha that 
was the team leader that make sure everybody had fun. You know, they right. they expected crew, they expected everybody on the set, and and they got along so well. And you know, he just made it such a, a, a really nice, enjoyable working environment. Albeit, it's always hard. Movie making is not easy. You're on the set 12 to 14 hours a day, and it's a slog. But guys like Will and that made it incredibly enjoyable. Um, I can't nice. say enough about him. You know, that picture you saw. And I use as an example of the sort of people that, like people like Will are, that I saw him on the news. He was in Australia at a tennis match. And I, I said, oh, my God, I didn't even know Will was in town. And I sent him a text. And, you know, within half an hour, I got a text back. Oh, come over to the hotel. We're going to go and see a cricket match. You know, come along to the cricket. I said, I hate fucking cricket. I don't want to go to the cricket. <laughs> and, we talked, you know, and it was just great. I got to hang out with him. We drove around Melbourne and looked at all this graffiti on the walls that he loved and was interested in. And, you know, so so for somebody like Will and if Will Stature to just out of the blue come join us, you know, and, and sort of welcome you in just like you're an old time friend. Again, that says a lot about him as a person, you know, mm -hmm. I think way, because you read so many stories about actor being aloof and they won't make eye contact, and they won't talk to people. Thankfully, I, I just haven't had that experience with so many of the wonderful actors I've worked with and uh, Will was one. Of course, you know, that was my intro to Margo. I went up to the Gold Coast, you know, which is up in Queensland, and got to train Margo there, you know, help her get ready for the uh, Suicide Squad. I had another friend of mine, John Isles, who's uh, ex-SAS. He was in the SAS for 30 years. He helped train the actors in weapons use to look, you know, effective and efficient with the use of weapons. So we had a ball. I started training Margo in Jiu Jitsu up on the Gold Coast. And again, she she reminds me a lot of Scarlett in, in that you cannot get a more committed actor, you know, or person. Nice. And I, I, I didn't train her for that long in the Jiu Jitsu, but I, I said to Margo, I said, you, I said, you should take power, you know, from how easy it is to train you. I said, I could literally, teach you any fight scene known, and I believe you could pull it off. You know, she's that gifted with attention to detail. Like, jiu-jitsu is a very complex art, you know. There's, it doesn't look, it looks like two people just rolling in the ground, but the leverage and the precise placement of limbs and everything else is, it's a very precise art. And I would explain a move to Margo, and I had another young lady into jiu-jitsu that I got to pair up with her, and I would watch her, and I would just see her brain move this wrist, move this hand, move her hip. And I, and again, I became very aware of her attention to detail, which, by the way, is why someone like Margot is as good as she is and why she's where she's at. It doesn't happen by accident, I don't believe. So just an absolute joy and, and just a little Aussie chick, as we like to say. <laughs> she was on Neighbours, a TV show here in Australia, a little soap opera for four years. And that was her starting ground, and I don't believe she's changed since. She's funny, she's down to earth, she's totally unaffected, and uh, and just nice. a true professional. So there you go. Nice, nice. Mm. I just she's, found oh, out right, like right. maybe a week ago that she was Australian. I had no idea. Yeah. Like <laughs> I think it's fascinating. I, it's fascinating when like somebody like from England and Australia can pull off like an American accent so well and like fool you. Like, can, can, yeah, you, can well, you? Oh, look, I can do it. Well, I lived in Los Angeles for 35 years, you know, and now yeah. to an Aussie, they, or they say I have an accent. To an American, they obviously pick it up because I don't focus on it. I'm able to do it, but you've got to remember that, that, you know, even in the old days, every movie that came out was pretty much American, you know? So this is what the audiences were used to hearing. You know, they, they, they just went used to it. And it's changed now, by the way. Of course, it's more acceptable now to have English accents, Australian accents. But for a while there, for you to be an actor <clears throat> and a professional actor, you have to take on the ability to adopt an American dialect, whether it's a southern accent, maybe a, you know, East Coast, more of a New York kind of Bronx accent or what they call mid-American, mid you know, or standard American. And you have to learn it. All those people like the Margos, all those people you would have seen on a show like Neighbours would 
most of the time have also been going to voice coaches, dialect coaches, and learning to be able to speak with a very flawless American accent. Um, and that's why you see some of them just do such a good job. They have to, you know, it's almost like knowing how to hit your mark on a, on a set when you, you get there. You just wouldn't get a job if all you could do was, was sound Australian because, <coughs> excuse me, I mean, you can imagine that if you're in Europe and suddenly the actor, g'day mate, how you going? You know, yeah, did you have a good day? They'd be like, what the fuck? You know, they don't understand. You know, we speak a lot of faster. There's a lot of slang mm -hmm. in our accents. And as soon as you get an audience that doesn't quite hear the words or understand it, you lose them. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I'm just reiterating, which is just a skill that a lot of Aussie actors have to have and still today even more so will have, you know, the good ones anyway. Copy that. Awesome. Uh, classic fight here from the Octagon. Uh, you versus Chuck Norris. Amazing fight, classic fight. And you're so good with weapons, especially the Katana sword. Did you have any input uh, with the with the actress who played Katana in Suicide Squad? Or was, or oh. was that somebody from your team? Where no, you had... no, no, that was, that was all me. You know, I got oh, nice. Yeah, um, Karen Fukuhara was playing Katana. Once again, here I go again, but what a lovely you know, young lady she was. And again, she, she again, I, you know, what can I say? The through line of all these people that you talk about, I say there's no wonder they're so good at what they do because of their commitment. Do you know what I mean? They literally want to be the best they can be in front of that camera. They don't just get on there and try and sleepwalk their way through it. And Karen and I did hours and hours of work with a katana. Um, you know, working the stroke, because she was supposed to be very traditional, you know, in a sense with a sword. As you know, there's a lot of like samurai movies and there's a lot of twirling. If, if you ever study, you know, um, Kenjutsu or, or use of the sword, you realize that that is not Japanese. The Japanese are very, they're very Zen based, meaning if this one simple cut can do the job, why would you do that? You know what I mean? There's a simplicity in what they do with a lot of their martial arts, especially with the sword. So I had to sort of keep it based, you know, in a very fundamental, and very kind of look to, to what you can say. I mean, it's still a movie, by the way, and it still has to be kind of showy, you know. Yeah. There's an old saying that what's real on camera is often quite boring. So that's yes, true. You have yeah. to strip it, but it was even how to draw the katana. You know, I wanted to be very correct with her understanding, her respect for the blade. Anyone that knows anybody that studies Japanese sword, I mean, there's such reverence to the katana, you know, to the sword, the way you unsheath it, the way you inspect it and everything else, and how you cut and resheath the sword. All of that is very important. So I worked a lot with Karen on that. and. Once again, I think she did uh, did a phenomenal job, and she was yeah. she's great in uh, the boys as well. Yeah, and she was up oh, yeah. for a couple of awards, acting awards, and I just I just warms my heart when I see that because she she just deserves it. You know, she's the sweetest kid, and I'm so so happy to see the success that someone like her's having. And uh, so it was yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, it, Suicide Squad overall was great. You know, with the original one with with um boomerang captain boomerang Jai <laughs> I mean, you know again he's another aussie down to the core i mean he's yeah. you couldn't get more aussie than him yeah mate he'll be right yeah no fucking worries you know <laughs> he's my favorite character in that movie me too yeah. he's my favorite character. And, and what happens right. in, the, in the newer one i was like yeah. no uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i didn't but, mind it I wanted more Captain Boomerang in the second one, but uh, it was yeah. funny. It was funny what happened to him, though. Uh, but yeah, let's let's go on to the newest Suicide Squad. Here. We got some behind the scene uh, shots here of you and James Gunn. That's awesome. how was it working with James? James, James, you know, I didn't know what to make of James initially because obviously I'd never met the man. You know, you hear stories and everything else, but he's um, he's. The best thing about James, and it might sound like this should be par for the course, but James knew exactly what he wanted. He was very definite with what he wanted out of an action scene, out of a dramatic scene. In other words, it wasn't that you would get on set and then he'd try and figure it out. 
which there are some directors that really do shoot from the hip, you know, which ne not necessarily a bad thing because it allows it to be quite spontaneous. Excuse me one second. Sure. <coughs> After a little cough. So it helped that, you know, when it came to action scenes that James would give you a, a very, very detailed blueprint of the feeling and everything else that he would want in a scene. And I'm talking about from my point of view, you know, as a fight coordinator. Um, and, you know, interesting enough, James had music, even even in rehearsals and, and particularly when we shot, James, as you hear throughout Suicide Squad, there's all these, these songs that play. And these are favorite tracks, like Harley's, you know, when she does her big fight is just a gigolo. Um, you know, he James just loved that song. And he would play that even with the rehearsals and during shooting over loudspeakers as a way to set a cadence for the camera moves, you know, it set sort of a pace for the scene. Yeah. But every different action scene had a different song, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and he, again, he, he just knows exactly what he wants. He's, uh, he's, he's, uh, boy, he can be quite forceful too when he doesn't get what he wants, you know, but that's okay. That's a director's job. He also had a very good eye. You know, I remember looking at it. There was a scene where Margot's character is Harley Quinn is we're in Panama and she's got to jump from a couple of levels up the side of a building, you know, and we had wires, of course, you know, and we did a rehearsal. We always pre-visit and show James. And it looked fantastic. And it was just one little move that I would have noticed. And James, well, stop. I, he would say, I don't believe that. I don't believe she could do that. And I thought, wow, I love that. Because, yes, you can go over the top in Marvel films and everything else, have people with supernatural sort of powers. But James wanted all these characters to be totally grounded in the skill set that they were supposed to have, meaning Harley Quinn is not a super villain. She can't fly. She can't jump tall buildings at a you know with a single bound. Right. She was athletic. She had a gymnastics background and everything else as the character. So I just thought it was interesting that I wouldn't have noticed it, but he just suddenly saw just one little glitch in the wire work that made him say, "No, I don't believe that." You know, and he wanted to fix it. And I don't think an audience would have ever noticed, nor even paid any particular critical attention to it, but I love the fact that that I realized he wasn't just watching the shape of something. He was incredibly detailed, you know, in regard of what he wanted. So yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, and, and and the the other good thing that I loved about James, you know, I got to found out that James he studied so many of the Hong Kong action movies. You know, he nicely knew of my work and everything else, which was nice. He had respect for my history and what I could bring to the fights in that regard. But he studied Sammo Hong and Jackie Chan and, and different Hong Kong action directors. He studied the camera position, how they would edit fight scenes together. And I thought that's that's pretty cool. You know, that was very refreshing to hear. Yeah. How cool is that? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. This movie made me even more of a fan of John Cena and Jill Kinnaman. <laughs> this movie, man, I'm telling you, I really enjoyed uh, their performances in this film, man. They were hilarious, and man, that fight they had, which we're gonna we're gonna get to there. How was it um, working with uh, Joel and Cena? You know, John Cena, what a what a gem! Again, he uh, when I met him, again. So respectful, but so committed. He said, Rich, he said, I will turn up on time. He said, I will give you a hundred percent to get what we need to get. Meaning again, what do I keep saying? The through line here is passionate actors that just really want to be the very best they can be. I can't, it, it, this is a lesson to anybody out there, by the way, you know, it's the old thing of, a, you know, a job worth doing is a job worth doing well. I mean, that's the through line that I see in so many of these actors and John Cena, he had his own particular way of learning, as you know. He's a WWE wrestler. In fact, I was all excited when I met John. I said, oh, you know, do you like jujitsu? Do you like grappling? Hate it, he said. Hate grappling. I said, what do you mean you hate it? You know, you're in the WWE. He just didn't enjoy it. You know, he had a, some signature moves, you know, that he would do. Didn't like grappling at all. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. 
I probably thought, thank God, because if he had been good, and if you've seen the size of his arms, I thought, yeah. oh man, this wouldn't be a good experience for me wrestling <laughs> someone like John Cena if he could actually move. But he uh, he was committed, you know. He was he's very structured. He's one of the most intelligent guys you will meet. I mean, he told me when he he recently finished a movie with Jackie Chan, and out of that decided he wanted to teach himself Mandarin. So he could speak fluent Mandarin. Oh my God. He could do a lot of takes on the set in his trailer. He had a piano set up. He would play piano, you know, he taught himself how to play. He loved challenges, you know. John was somebody that really liked to get out of his comfort zone and tackle sort of tasks and just really apply himself. He read a lot, you know, I, I actually gave him a copy of uh, a book that I love called Zen and Japanese Culture, you know. It was just, just about mindset of the samurai and everything. And in, in a weird way, because he was also using a sword, you'll, you know, which we'll get to, you know, using a katana type sword in Suicide Squad, I thought, yeah, I'd like to introduce him to that samurai mindset, the code of Bushido and everything else. And he, he loved that. Um, he would like to learn very much. He see, he was very definite. Everybody's different, by the way, you discover with how you train them. And part of the job is trying to figure out the best way to, to basically teach somebody. And John started with legs. He didn't want to know anything. He showed me the footwork. Everything started with getting the footwork down precisely. Then he would add, you know, some of the sort of the, the moves on top of that, whether it's sword work or throwing a punch. Or whatever it is you know it, it was very structured but he just knew that's the way he would learn and you know again worked for him so committed and and great to work with and uh i and look at his comedic timing i mean <laughs> I, it's like yourself i you know i think james even made a comment that john senior is, is the most gifted in you know improvisational actor he could improvise and add humor better yeah. than anybody else he'd work with and i thought well that's that's quite a quite a credit to get from someone like james gunn yeah and we, by the way look he's doing peacemaker now you know spin-off series on netflix and you know listen the sky's the limit you know he was also when we shot this one also shooting uh fast and the furious you know right diesel so he was flying off when he had time off and coming back to us i mean think about the workload of juggling you know, mm -hmm. shooting in London and then shooting in Atlanta, Georgia, and of course uh, in Panama as well. So mm -hmm. he had a big workload, but again, just uh, just amazing talent. Yeah, yeah. I was oh man, I was busting up. Are you a part of the uh, the spinoff show? No, no. We we were already here in Australia and committed to uh, another show, but the request was there for our team to go in and work on Peacemaker, oh. but. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's always depends after time with whatever else is right. going on. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I've worked with Guy for many, many, many years. So I sort of like that. I'm thrilled to be a part of Guy's team. So the work I get is usually the work that Guy gets, you know, and okay. he takes years. I yeah. call him part of his team accordingly. So that dictates a lot of that. Copy that. Uh, what Fast 9, though, um, a lot of people that seen that movie, they thought the end fight sequence between John and Vin Diesel was very disappointing. Nobody I, was disappointed with this fight. Yeah, you know, and I have nobody was disappointed. Nobody complained about this fight. People talked about this fight after the movie came out. This was this fight was phenomenal. That that's just so good to hear. Look, you know, we've talked about uh, John, of course, and his skills. Well. You know, Joel Kinnaman, again, I introduced Joel to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's now sold on it. You he's know, hooked. He, he's a purple belt as well in Jiu-Jitsu. Nice. Love very, very skilled, phenomenal actor, very, very skilled, you know, as, as in drama, you know, as well as action. And, you know, that fight was, uh, was great. You know, um, we had some... So, of course, you know, as everybody knows, you have stunt doubles and everything and fight doubles for these people because that's the way we go about working out what a fight is. You know, you can't get the actor for weeks and weeks before just helping work out the fight. So we put it together and, um, you know, there was, again, that's, Nate Perry, you know, was there. He was doubling Idris Elba. We'll talk about him. I, I guess I just want to rave about the stunt guys that we had in Atlanta aside sure. from our 
Aussie sure. team, but you know, Ingrid claimed it was Margot's double. We'll talk about that later. Adam Lytle doubled Rick Flag, you know, or Joel Kinnaman. And Adam was fantastic to work with. And again, you, you know, you had uh, John Cena's doubles, you know, with a couple of people because the main double was away a lot in London with John. So we had to get somebody else to work with sometimes in Atlanta, you know, but Spencer and these guys were just amazing to work with in order to construct the fight. So getting back to it, you know, what, what I loved about this fight was that First of all, it starts with a reflection in a helmet. You oh, know, brilliant. A, a helmet. That way, you know, you can say, oh, what a great idea until you try and do it. I mean, it was so hard to figure out the exact arc that would allow one continuous camera move to keep them in shot, you know. So that had to be figured out a lot. But I thought, what a great idea, rather than just having the fight in all its glory to have it, you know, as a reflection like that, but, you know, was just, again, another, another James Gunn, something he wanted. Henry as a DOP was phenomenal with working with James and getting the shots that James wanted. So good result, but James particularly wanted, in fact, he wanted all the characters as I've already said, to be very grounded, meaning that they shouldn't run up a wall, you know, and be ridiculous if that wasn't part of the character. And, that he wanted this fight to be very brutal. This was like mm. a barroom brawl. These were two guys that are very similar in skill sets with weapons work, with military style background. So he didn't want anything flashy. It, it was supposed to be very untidy and quite ugly, which suited my style down to a T because we were able to get a little bit of MMA type moves in there, but yeah. but, but untidy. And I use that word a lot because I, you know, I. As you know, I did bodyguard work for 20, 25 years, worked on doors. I know what real fights look like. And the one thing they're not is tidy. You never see a nice, crisp street fight. It's, it's right. rough. It's off balance. It's it's out of kilter. And I love when you can get a fight with guys like this will, that will get that that rough edge to the whole fight where you, you're looking at you almost want to feel like you're looking at a documentary, you know, going, oh, shit, this is this is really happening. Now, of course, you use wires. I mean, some of the work, you know, that our stunt doubles did, um, Adam and, and, and people, when you see John Cena pick up the Rick Flagg character, you know, and shot put him, you know, into these hoppers, you know, which were yeah. really the feed bins that fed the prisoners or the captives that were victims of Star <laughs> You know, they had stars right. on their face. Anyone that hasn't seen the movie won't know what the hell I'm talking about. But anyway, you do. <laughs> and, and so those hoppers, they were metal. They were hard, you know. And, and some of those stunts which you saw the guys doing, that was brutal. I mean, I always I had my heart in my mouth with a couple of takes because you couldn't have just totally breakaway props in that particular case. They were solid, you know. And because Joel was wearing a T-shirt, you couldn't pad him up. You know, so oh. what was really happening to the extent that the wires really catapulted uh, the doubles into into the hopper, and and you see the way that that Adam you know falls to the ground. I mean, a couple of times it's like, oh God, if he hits the back of his head in the wrong place. Yeah. So it's it's not just it's not all song and dance, you know, with fights like that. There's a, there's a lot of risk, but. The brutality of it, I think it worked, and I and I love the fact that the fight had drama. I mean, the yeah. one thing that I <clears throat> I'm very keen on is trying to tell a story with a fight, and and sometimes the simplest punches and actions can tell that story effectively. It doesn't have to be a multitude of punches and moves to really sell a story and. If the audience believe the characters and they're, and they're sort of they're going along with that journey as they watch the movie, it needs to stay real to the character and his skill set. Once again, Rick Flag and Peacemaker, they, they weren't superhuman. They were just military type dudes that are amazingly good at what they did. So when you saw the fight, it wouldn't be like Karate Kid with coming up in the air and doing silly jump kicks. <laughs> Again, very grounded to powerful guys doing what they do best. And the end part where you see um, Rick Flagg on top of, um, you know, Peacemaker, I, look at the drama in that. 
I oh, mean, man. Look, look at the expressions that John Cena had, how true to character he was. Look at Rick Flagg when he got stabbed with a piece of, you know, yeah. the toilet system that had broke and he used that. We decided we'd use that stab Rick Flagg in the heart. And, and look at the dramatic presence that Joel brought to that. I thought, that's, that's beautiful. You know, and, and I say that because I've often said in the 80s with a lot of the action films I did, as long as you had half a dozen fights in a movie, you could sell it. I'm talking about the VHS market in the old days and in the DVD market. It really didn't matter about the drama. You could have drama, drama, drama fight stopped, uh, drama stopped, then you have a fight, which often didn't really correlate with much else in the movie. It was just there because it was an action film and then the drama continued. Well, it's great if, again, you can have drama within a fight. I thought the ending, and, 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 and that interaction, those close-ups between John Cena and, and Joel Kinnaman made that fight for me. You know, you, you saw the heart of the characters, you know, in the end result of that fight. And for me, that's what makes a fight work. You know, it's bringing the drama, telling the story. We used to call it non-verbal dialogue, you know, choreography. Mm -hmm. Non-verbal dialogue, where the physicality tells the story of the journey of the character, why they're fighting, what they want out of that fight, and what the end result, you know, should be. So, that's yeah, awesome. it, it got me. <laughs> I was like, no, but it was an awesome fight. You know, the emotion got me. I was like, oh no, but hey, that means the 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 scene exceeded. You know, yeah, and, so. and again, you know, I want to say also that both of uh, Joel and John both committed to rehearsal process again. You know, we had, you know, doubles, of course, you know, work the whole thing out. We would film it. We would show them. And then the job is to get, it's mainly the doubles then that will help walk their actor through the choreography. You know, that's very much a part of it. Um, so that's what happened, you know, and it was a great result. As I said, Adam Hart was another guy that helped double uh, Joel Kinnaman in there. And, um, yeah. Well, let's take a look at some it's of the behind the scenes. Uh, hats off to them. Sorry, is it yeah. so double because they yeah. they work their asses off in that fight. So oh yeah, they're they're our heroes. <laughs> they do all the hard bumps, man. But yeah, let's yeah. look at uh let's look at some of the behind the scenes stuff. I'm going to show you Instagram clips first, and then we'll sh I'll show you those other video clips. But yeah, feel free, uh, Richard, to uh, do some commentary about what's going on here. You know, this again was this was prepping to get an idea of that shot put on the you basically flag up the edge where all those speed things are and you know the way we work, you know, with Guy and everybody we build sets like we replicate the exact parameters of the action that we use. We do that so there's no surprises that there's a little more distance to be figured that we need to throw somebody or where we need to move or how close the hoppers were to each other. We're very precise. <laughs> Ooh, ouch, man. Yeah, that's Adam Hart there and Spencer tucking at him. You don't see, look how hard that is. And there's no mucking around with that. And this is, this is a fun guys looking for all. Come on. We just needed to know exactly what would happen when the system broke, where the piece would go, the effect yeah. of the water, you know, on the ground. Of course, we've got boxes and mats. Man, that. look at that. You couldn't Beautiful. have thrown any harder, could you? I know. <laughs> Beautiful, man. Woo. Yeah, These guys are awesome. That, that's the rehearsal process that Guy and, and Timmy and those guys put everybody through. And as I said, it's a collaborative. Yeah. There's the boxes representing the Yeah. yeah.
<laughs> rat catcher over the back, you know, if you're the one that has the disc that will expose the government's misfeelings. But but you, you you can see from that, you know, the, this is what it takes to be a stunt person, by the way. There's no sugar coat on that. Those yes. guys working their asses off, you know, with that rehearsal process. And that's what we show the actor and that's what the actor steps into and it's that sort of intensity that gives them an idea of what's possible in a right. fight and again you know the stunties they just they just did such a phenomenal they're, they're the unsung heroes of action films you know they're yeah they get credit to the end of the film that's probably this big but without them none of this stuff happens you know so God, but like, I, man this can, this one this clip tripped me out when uh because I was like, oh man, they're setting the guy on fire. <laughs> I, I, like, can, I can never go ahead, be Tony. a stunt. I can never be a stunt person. Like <laughs> I'm afraid to fall on ice, you know, let alone get thrown in, in a bathroom or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this one uh, was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. There's the beginning of it, I believe. Yeah, this is the start of it. Right there, look at that. Right there, man. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. Look at that. Is that really is that really Idris Elba right there? Or is that um there we you know we have Spencer as a John Cena double and Nate Perry as an Idris Elba double when we do those rehearsals. Okay. Obviously on the day of the shoot they're in there they're doing it but you wouldn't put them at risk because that's about finding out you know you, there's no question that stuntman is on fire i mean are you kidding me so you have to work out what is close enough for the actor to be able to effectively stand you know in, in order to work out the shot you know the lens size and everything else and what is safe and that's why nothing's left a chance you know rehearsals are all about finding everything that could go wrong and then hedging your bets against that. You know, we never do a stunt and go, well, hopefully nothing goes wrong. Our job is to sort of figure out everything that can go wrong because Murphy's Law always kicks in no matter how well rehearsed you are. But again, we, we, we just rehearse to that point so we know, you know, again, what problems we can run into. But this is awesome. Thank you so much, Richard, for sharing some of these behind the scenes clips here. Let's let's take a look yeah, at some yeah, more. Have this, a couple like this one. Nobody has this, by the way. So there you there go. There you go. Exclusive chat. Enjoy. We got some more clips here. Let's go ahead and play this. Uh then this is uh Margot yeah, Robbie's stunt this double. This is, this is no this is this is why I wanted you to see this because this was rehearsals for, you know, what an incredible action sequence. And this is all James Gunn that wrote this out and knew what he wanted. But, you know, it's a sequence of Margot when she's captured at Corto Matilda's and she's hanging from this, this contraption. She ends up choking the guard out. There's a shootout. And part of the fight ends up with her grabbing a javelin that the original javelin to start a movie presents to her. And she's trying to figure out what, why he wanted her to have it anyway. It turns up in this fight down this this hallway where she fights multiple people using the javelin like a bow, like a bow staff. And this was this is actually Margot rehearsing this. So this is not a stunt double. And you tell me, I mean, you look at this, this is still a very early in rehearsal. Look at the way Margot moves. I mean, okay. she's so incredibly talented which is why I said you could teach it just about any fight you could come up with. Look at even this little sequence with the way Margot handles this. Nice. Who's not, by the way, handled the staff before. Okay. You know, you know, twirls and how to manipulate the staff, how to make it feel like, you know, it was part of her. That's part of the job. But anyway, just roll that. It's only a short bit, but... Yeah, let's take a look at it. I'm excited. Let's do this. <laughs> Wow, look at that. Let's, just, let's look at it again. Look at that. Wow. You hear the song playing Just the Gigolo? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the great thing with someone like Margot is, is her uh, attention to 
detail. Just hold that one for a moment. Because yep. well, even with the bow, you know, you can give some of your staff. In fact, I see it a lot of competition with the staff. Generally, a lot of the trickers, they call them, you know, the extreme martial artists, they use a bow that's very light. It's It feels about as heavy as a toothpick. And it's a lot of twirling and flipping around. For me, it has very little to do with actual combat with us with a staff, you know? Right. So part of the training with Margo is again, yes, it's balletic, you know, that whole sequence moving down the hallway because James Gunn wanted a continuous sequence with no cuts, you know what I mean? And now of course there ends up being some cuts with some of the wire work, but generally speaking, he had, he was, they were using Henry and James were using this very new red camera, which is very small in size. And it meant that Henry could be in the middle of the action, you know, the camera people. It wasn't a big, heavy sort of cased camera that we used to use. It was very maneuverable. So it meant that action scenes like Margot going down that hallway could be the cameras on a dolly moving with her. And it was a continuous flow, almost like a ballroom dance, you know. Yeah. Later on, you see Margot in a red dress and some of the sequences were made to almost be like she's, she's dancing. But getting back to the use of the bow, I said, Margo, you know, when you swing a bow, there's there's what I call a focus point. You know, there's a point where that weapon technically is making contact. You can't just have a continuous just flow with the weapon. You can only do that if it never hits anything. But if you actually hit something, there's a reverberation, there's a rebound, there's an action reaction principle we call about. Right. You would even totally understand that. So you would swing it through and at a certain point you would see that focus we call it that intent on the weapon and a lot of people might see but i do and i just go man hats off to you margo for understanding that sort of complexity when in the middle of a fight staying in character doing something you wouldn't normally do and carrying it off to that sort of um, excellence is is just fantastic Nice. Uh, shout out to Lone Wolf Ronin, new member, channel member, becoming a certified badass again. Thank you, sir, for supporting the channel. Ooh. You rock. You are awesome. Uh, down here, we have Marco G uh, just enjoying the show. Good to see Richard back on the show. And uh, Marco G also said, uh, good movie technique. He's talking about the Margot Robbie scene. Finishes her moves fully. Fluid motion. Very nice. There you go. Some more, some more Richard Norton love there. <laughs> All right, you ready to see the next clip? Let's do it. This was a great scene at the end of the movie. The yeah, well, this, big fight in the rain was awesome. Yeah, in the rain. And you can see this was to determine the blood effect. You notice the Spencer's using, uh, as John Cena, as peacemaker, he's got a sword with right. tubes attached to it. We wanted to see the effects of the flicking blood you see it going through the air hence it's in slow motion um, oh nice look at that how oh, how's that happening yeah no well, they, it's attached to a tube that you can't see that goes down the hand oh. the sword and through spencer and then it's attached to a machine that pumps supposedly you know fake blood through how and cool is that that was designed to see the effects of water and blood mixed together and um <laughs> And, you know, I, I love that fight because I was very surprised that that when uh, in the jungle scene, when John Cena uses his sword to go through quite a number of uh, guards, rather in this scene, it caught on my teeth, sorry. Um, <laughs> he, he wanted it again to be very samurai-like, you know. He wanted the katana to be used in very much old school, you know, a bit of a Kurosawa look to it. Which surprised me, you know, which I was happy with because that's more down my alley anyway, as far as it yeah. is. And, uh, you know, again, look at these kind of like Chris Pat and be a friend, you know, takes a good story. I was hugging the camera. Look at that. Get out of there, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ready for the final oh. hit. Boom. Love it. Yeah. So again, it's, you know, again, it's part of the rehearsal process that goes into uh, into what we do, and I, I love the way that John was able to carry off that whole sword sequence. You know, very believable for me. And again, not over the top. You know, in this was also a once again a, a, the orders from James. It, it, right, right. He didn't want moves that were superfluous. You know, 
you know, if, if you did a move, it should be pertaining to the actual result wanted out of the fight as opposed to be very just flowery and showy and everything else, you know, so quite right. functional. Copy that. Now, this is this is uh, the uh, Rick Flag versus uh, Peacemaker fight again from a different angle. Is this the reflection angle? Yes. Well, it goes all the way through if you watch this. this all right, is let's a, check it out. A rehearsal where we're trying to figure out how the reflection would work and, and uh, the boxes all represented the actual set that was built in uh, the studio in Atlanta. Nice. Let's, let's watch this. This is going to be fun. <laughs> In other words, the camera here is Adam Lytle and his That was nice. Oh, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> these guys are these guys are animals. They're animals. Oh. Maybe some nice little added blood effects. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. This is amazing. Phenomenal. Love it. That's where he grabs the shard, right? Ah. Oh, man. Ugh. Man, that was phenomenal. If you saw those two guys just like that in another action movie, you would totally believe it. I mean, you know, nothing's nothing's left on the they, they put it all out there on the floor, you know, the effort and the intensity. And this is, <laughs> this is, by the way, is what you end up showing James. You know, James, of right. course, is happened. And I go through Guy. Guy Norris has to sign off at it. It's previews, as we call it. We show it to James to show him with a bit of an edit. This is, this is the idea of the fight, you know. And he will either offer changes or little adjustments. And that's just part of the process. But... Again, you know, the studies just were amazing. I mean, oh, that's phenomenal. Put in on that's just a rehearsal, but it's totally full on. Tony, yeah. let's let's go, man. Me and you, we're going to recreate that. <laughs> we're more like Godzilla and Kong. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to re recreate that and fail horribly. That was phenomenal, Richard. Thank you so much for sharing yeah, those was... clips with us, man. That is so awesome. Yeah. Uh, right here, uh, thank you, Lone Wolf Ronan, uh, for the super chat, supporting the channel. He says, much love and respect, Mr. Norton. Loved your skill with that bow in China O'Brien and loved you against Benny the Jet in Kick Fighter. Glad to see you're still working in the industry. Hey, all right. Much appreciated. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're still here. You know, I'm God, I'm not a kid anymore, and I feel blessed to still be working in the industry. You know, I turned, I'm turned. i 71 now, so to have a, a, a career that's still going on in this day and age is, is I'm very, very thankful, and thank you for, for those comments. But Again, you don't look 71, and you're in better shape than all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good drugs, man. You just got to <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, you did you get a chance? Oh, go ahead, Richard. Any more clips of Margo fighting, or I probably don't have any, right? I mean, uh, I just have that. I thought that was her stunt double, but uh, that's the only one I have of, of her. Yeah, no, that's actually Margo doing that. Um, yeah. You know, I do have some other clips, but, you know, that was such a long fight for Margo. You know, when she... The great thing, you know, there's a scene that uh, this one? Seen where she's in this um, one, right? Um, Her escape. Yeah, well, there's that. That's where it all starts, you know. Oh right. well, it, it, 
Holland. That was that was part of her escape. Even like that scene you see with the guns, that we, you know, that was a multi sort of passageway room that she went in the middle with. And James particularly wanted an aerial shot where you see he would want her to shoot and basically turn and leave her arm lad behind and then catch up. Right. I tell you, that was like a twelve point move, you know, with it was very specific, continuous choreography of the studies had to be very precise with when they showed up in front of the lens. And, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time with Ingrid. Ingrid Klein it was uh, Margot's double, working that out, the timing out. I, I reckon it would have taken me a day to learn the timing and sequence of that. Margot came in and after like half an hour, pretty much had that whole sequence down in her brain hmm. and, and just performing it perfectly, you know, with the dress flowing. Wow. And you've got to understand, too, that this is what is so impressive is that, again, not only is it complex, the moves and the choreography that you have to remember as the actor, but you have to also be believable and in character and worried where the camera is. There's so many sort of mechanical considerations that go into performing an action scene. And, and you know, I, w I would even you know, teach Margot uh, what I call combat breathing or autogenic breathing, um, which is basically, a you know, that military forces use. It's, it's a really simple way to control adrenaline and heartbeat because when you get adrenalized, your heartbeat can go up to sometimes 200 beats a minute. And you need to be able to control that as a fighter in the ring or as sort of a military person, you know, out on the field. And I was, I said to Margot, the, the big thing with the training for you, Margot, and why we've got to work so hard is you you should look like you could do this in your sleep. This is what <laughs> you do. There shouldn't be any intensity or, 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 or concern or fear. Margot's whole character was she just loved the violence of it. You know, she had yeah. fun with it. Yeah. And so I would give her this breathing so it would just relax her because even the take, as I said to you, is very stressful. I don't care who you are. When you got hundred people standing there waiting all right roll cameras and action that stresses you you know because you want to look the best you want to be good for the movie you don't want to look, look like a dick and forget your choreography or whatever mm -hmm. so that's a lot so the breathing really helped and you know i'd give it to her just before a long action sequence which which again was incredibly beneficial and she took on board and the attitude also, you know, of looking, if you, you know, I wanted her to burst through those doors after she shoots all those dudes and headbutt the first guy. And, you know, and, and you watch her do that and it's just so damn believable. <laughs> and then that whole sight scene in the, the, it was really a storage room with the cell looking like cell doors. You know, Tim was very involved with the choreography of that as well, Timmy Wong, but it was about using a la Jackie Chan, it was about using the environment, so using the actual doors as weapons, not just relying on empty hand skills. And when Margot sort of originally comes in, she uses, she rips off part of her dress. And that was fun for me because I, I wanted to do something using, you know, in Indonesia, they, a lot of people wear a sarong, and there are a lot of them actually taught to use that in, in a defensive sort of mechanism, especially against knives, which everybody has. So I thought it'd be fun to use the dress, you know, as like they would use a sarong in Indonesian martial arts, you know, when you see her powering the way she wraps the sarong around the neck and you see the guard's knife hand is trapped to the neck and he's holding, she's holding him there and then she pulls it away and the, basically the guard cuts his own throat. Right. I mean, that's really real when it comes to actual Indonesian martial arts, you know paint at silat and, and arts like this. And so it was fun to sort of incorporate a little bit of that in there. Um, you know, as far as using that sarong, she grabs a guy around the neck and pitches him over her head. And, you know, we had to use wires, of course, but I, I just think the brutality of the fight came out in that regard. Even the jail cell is very, you notice there's one scene where I had we had the jail door. There's a guard, his arm stuck through there, and she smashes his face against yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We, we had maybe twice, and he drops. What is a very much James Gunn thing to people that know that, no, he wanted to hit it like eight times. So you see the guy getting smacked multiple <laughs> times in the head with his door. Not yeah. easy to do either, by the way, you know, for the stunty. 
But that that was a very much a James Gunn kind of um, addition, <laughs> you know, to, the, to the, the sense of the fight. And I tell you, one of the you wouldn't even probably notice it because there was a scene in that fight where Margot I wanted to throw a back kick, straight back kick to a guard's chest. And in rehearsal, I said, Margot, look at you. I said, you can you can snap that up to the guy's head. And if we can have camera over shoulder, have you turning and looking back and know that it's you doing that whole movement, how good is that? And on the day, she snapped this back kick out to this guy's head. I couldn't have done it half as far as fast in my best day, you know, 30 oh, years man. ago. I yeah. said, my God, how do you even do that? You know, that's how impressive <laughs> she is. So, <laughs> you know, it, it was a phenomenal result. And, 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 and the character, again, remember I told you about storytelling. If you notice, again, a little James Gunn thing, that when Margot comes in and she's got these AK-47s, you know, assault weapon since she's blasting everybody there's a spot where she stops because she sees the javelin oh sorry about that that's all right <laughs> there's a javelin against the wall and she sort of stops firing puts it down and grabs a javelin the whole point of that little little part of that fight was she didn't run out of bullets she could have kept <laughs> shooting the rest of them character wise he wanted to just she just gets bored you know she's like oh <laughs> let me use this this will be a lot more fun than just continuing to shoot and that's the sort of character elements that james would influx you know into into the mode or the feel of the fight and yeah i just love those little pieces and even even stabbing the guy at the end with the javelin you know we would work with margot on stances like very much traditional karate stances in showing your balance how you would actually look like you could be impale somebody and keep balance all the time while looking like she's going and having a smoke. You know what I mean? It, it, <laughs> it looked like it looked like just a walk in the park, and that's how casual it needed to be for Margaret to actually achieve that. I mean, even even when she's hanging from the ropes, I know James has made a big uh, deal of this, but. You know, when she's sort of tied up and she's being tortured, you know, and the guard yeah. turns around, that was fun because I I decided, you know, rather than just grab the guy with typically around the neck with the legs, we could do what we call a triangle choke. You know, it's designed to cut off the carotid arteries here and oxygen to the brain. And it's a real move, you know, albeit you wouldn't normally do it hanging from, you know, the <laughs> ceiling like that. Yeah. But it's a triangle choke. We got it to do that, which I loved. And... You know, so so there was a lot of detail is what I'm saying that would go into the into those fights. And what you saw, which James alluded to, when you see her do that and the guard drop to the door and she uses her toes to pick up the keys mm -hmm. and then she inverts and uses the key to unpick the lock, she absolutely did all of that. That oh, was wow. Oh, she wow. could do it. Because when we're shooting, I was back at the monitor and James is looking at me and is basically saying, oh, look, we'll need to cut. I said, no, James, trust me, Marga can do this all in one. And he kind of looked at me and she did. And, and that impressed the hell out of him that she could use her toes to actually pick up a key. Marga wow. bragged. He said, that was, that's the best part of her body. She said, I could write letters with my toes and do all sorts <laughs> of things. I could hit a sweater with my toes. But that was really her doing all of that. Wow, and then wow. fun things behind the scenes that you go, well, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. Wow. You know, that, yeah, is, yeah. that is impressive. Uh, yeah. you know, many people I've spoken with to talk about the film, pretty much all of us are in agreement that that whole entire fight sequence with her escape was just so much fun and really impressive and shot very well. And it was, you know, in our opinion, it was better than anything they had her do in birds of prey. And yeah, I'm being I honest. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get a uh, chance to run into Stallone? No, I didn't. No, that was all, that was all post involvement, you know, with that. We had, you know, another actor to walk around with a frame that sort of represented what Shark would look like. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but getting back to Margot, and again, I, I, I know I over sort of, sort of touting this so much, but, you know, I would go to that, you know, I would say to Margot, she had such a busy schedule. I mean, they're, they're working 12 hour days, and I would say, Margot, just give me, even if you give me 20 minutes at the end of the day, I, I would just try and teach the little aspects of the choreography and the tools, and I would have Ingrid there to help as well, of course, being her double. And she would turn up. I mean, she would have 12 hour days and be absolutely knackered and still turn up at our little stunt rehearsal room 
and just give me 20 minutes or half an hour, which is why the results are what they are. Again, nice. the commitment was uh, was just absolutely phenomenal. She loved the box, you know, she was staying in their rented house in Atlanta and, you know, we'd start teaching her. But when we put the gloves on, as for the picture, look at the, the smile on her face. She loved <laughs> it. The biggest, her biggest aim was to try and knock me backwards into their swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never going to happen, girlie. <laughs> but she just, she just enjoyed it so much, which again for me made it so enjoyable being around, you know, people like her. Look, again, Idris was the same. Idris was an interesting character. What a great dramatic actor. And I knew... When I saw this scene, you know, when they're in this bus, you know, with Ratcatcher, you know, with a young lady who's amazing, you know, Brazilian girl, but some of the, and the drama and the intent of that scene, for me, made this, I knew this was going to be a stand-up movie because, yes, you know, I, I, read a, I read a report where they said the movie is believable and truthful while being fantastical, meaning yes, it had to be real. Everything mm -hmm. was for real even though switch to a shark walking around on two feet eating people you know, yeah yeah like, fuck you know or you got <laughs> the scary eyed monster but everything was still played for real and uh that was really and if you watch there's little things like idris idris is very street smart you know yeah. he would joke that he could take all of us out and i sort of tended to believe maybe there's a bit of truth to that but <laughs> even, you know there's a little scene where he first confronts uh viola davis as waller and he's, he picks up a pen and sticks it to her throat that was crazy i know it's a simple thing that normally somebody would stand up lean forward and then make it very obvious what what we wanted what i wanted interest to do which you did perfectly is if you've got a weapon you tend to lead with a weapon you don't want to telegraph what you're doing the weapon leads because it doesn't take power to stab somebody in the throat. And to right. watch the way he understood that is when I went, this guy's got real street smarts. So like he understands what we call an initial move, a non-telegraphed move, where he suddenly the pen. There was a cut they used, but when you saw the wide shot, I said, I couldn't have done that better. You know, that's exactly what I would do as I was going to preemptively stab somebody in the throat or at least look like I intended to. So again, another another wonderful guy to work with. You notice, you know, the John Cena, um, uh, Joel Kinnaman or Peacemaker and Flag when they first enter and they're taking out all the guards when they're trying to save, um, sorry, Idris, Idris Elba, yeah, yeah. a blood sport. Yeah. And peacemaker, beg your pardon. You know, that was a competition. James wanted yeah. to be this smart at uh, each other and it was so it's funny unbelievably violent at the same time i mean you're sort of laughing but you go look at him you know did you see johnson when he just like multiple parts to a guy <laughs> trolley there's a guy in a bathtub who gets electrocuted but even even that was very precise i was, I was so thrilled to have nate perry he's, he's just become a dear friend doubling it just but he helped a lot with that because Idris's character, you know, Bloodsport has like a slingshot, you know, we used it like a weighted bowler in part of that fight. We used it as a garrote and even the garrote is very precise the way that would really work. You know, it's trying to get as much detail, even though a lot of it you don't actually see on camera. But Idris was a trip man and just what, a, as I said, what a wonderful dramatic actor as well as his ability to handle drama. I wish, I wish Idris had have ended up playing James Bond. I think it'd be phenomenal. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I don't think anybody would disagree with that pick. Yeah, let's talk about that too. You know, he was considered yeah. for that role, but and everyone's everyone's unexpected favorite hero of the year, right. Polka Dot Man. <laughs> Nobody saw this coming, man. Everybody was fans of Polka Dot Man by the end of this movie. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, well, just so it, it, as you know, James was was very keen to get a whole mix of to the general public, unknown characters, you know, in that sort of world, you know, hence picking out Pol Polka Dot Man or the detachable kid, you know, his arms detached. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what the fuck, you know, you know, well, you know but, but that again was part of the idea to add a sort of an off the world sense of humor that, that again is very much uh, James Gunn. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we got uh, another support here. Thank you. 
Paul Brown the third. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. He says, hey, Fat Samurai guy, I'm loving the interview with Mr. Richard Norton. It is great to see the legend share his knowledge of filmmaking with us. Thanks all around, sirs. Much respect. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Paul, did you, did you do that twice? You didn't have to do it twice, buddy, but I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> he uh, did it twice. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate it, my friend. Uh, but yeah, this was an absolute blast uh, having you on here, Richard. I could talk to you all day, my friend. Mm -hmm. And what a fun movie. It was just, that, that's what it's all about at the end of the day, is going to the theater or watching it at home, being entertained and having a blast. Uh, you know, I'm so happy, me, you know, me and Tony being fan of your, of your work. Uh, we were you. so happy that you were actually a part of this, you know, helping getting everyone together. And it looks like everybody on set had a blast as well. <laughs> Look at the crew I, you, there. Know, you know, I've got to mention my biggest regret, and it's a real, it's a shame. But okay. you notice the end credits, a lot of us weren't credited. Like, there is no spike coordinator credit. Tim Wong, the second unit director, was not credited, you know. Nick oh, Brown. no. Yeah, uh, there's a number of guys, Chris Patton, who was a cis coordinator. Go figure. I mean, what the fuck? I'm sorry, but that's just like. You kidding me? You know, I mean, if you go to IMBD, we're listed, but as uncredited. But I don't even know how that happens. I'm I'm not happy about that. But anyway, oh, that that's I just put a little little peeve into the whole thing. No, I, that no, we're I me and Tony. Me, yeah, me and Tony are on board with that. Yeah. <laughs> we're not happy either. We didn't know that. Well, it's, oh. a, it's a lot of hard work that everybody, even in Panama. Yeah. You know, when we went to Panama to shoot the exteriors there. That's it's one of the most dangerous places in the world to be where we were in that particular neighborhood. They even the the local production stuff even had to pay some of the gang leaders to leave town. They actually gave them money to be not there when we're shooting. Because wow. on each side of the street you had warring factions as far as street gangs and everything go. And we're in the middle of that. So Incredible effort. So all I'm saying is that to all the stunt people, cast and crew, you know, the very least you'd want is a credit for some of the work you did. Not so much for me, you know, I'm I'm past my sort of used by date in, in some sense of the word with what I do. But for the long, a lot of the younger guys, credits mean everything. I mean, that's part of how you build a career is people looking for your name up there on screen. So anyway, right. a bit unfortunate. Well, hey, 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 be honest. That's why we love you, Richard. You're always honest. <laughs> and hey, hey, that's why, you know, we do podcasts like this. You know, we want to get the word out and spread the word mm -hmm. how awesome, yeah, you know, these stuntmen and actors are putting in all the hard work. We want to make sure everybody watching uh, knows about it. So uh, it, it sucks it wasn't in the credits, but it's here on the channel, goddammit. <laughs> that's right. We're going to spread this, share this video, Richard. Share this video to all your stuntmen. Hey, all the stuntmen, filmmakers that made this movie happy, happen. All you badasses, we really appreciate what you guys do. And keep yeah, doing yeah. your thing, and we will be there to support it. That's right. And include me in it. As I said, I just, it, what a, it's all about a team. I just can't emphasize that enough, you know, yeah. because team. You know, as I said, I'm the last one to get on and say, oh, this is all me. I wish it was all me. I wish it was that smart, but I'm not, you know. It's a collaborative <laughs> process of, of phenomenal – you saw some of the stunt you with the rehearsals. I mean, oh, my God. Phenomenal. You know? So, you know, the commitment from them and the crew and the special effects and the people that build the props, I mean, it's kudos to all of them. It's Again, it's a collaborative process. It really ends up with the result we get. So, uh, hey – much respect, you know, much love to all those people. And, and of course, Guy, you know, that always uh, thankfully uses me on projects like this and allows me to be a part of, uh, of, of movie making. Again, uh, this was uh, an awesome blast talking movies and hanging out with the legend himself, Richard Norton, giving the shout outs and respect to his team and all the filmmakers and stuntmen that make the magic happen. We really appreciate you guys. You're our heroes. And uh, again, Richard, make this your second, third, fourth home <laughs> and come back whenever you want. And we can talk I movies. Hope, I hope he comes back again and we could talk about Mad Max Fury Road. Ah, maybe in the future. Oh, yeah. or, or, yeah, yeah. Or, or just all the post-apocalyptic ones. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, that would be fun. That was, that was what Equalizer 2000 was, a post-apocalyptic paying homage. It wasn't really, it was really stealing the idea. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, that was a Roger Coleman film because Mad Max yeah. just came out, and before it actually gets released, a lot of those yeah. companies would quickly take the idea, make the film in a matter of weeks, and sort of yeah. get it out right. there before the actual theatrical release of the big box office movies. But yeah, no, I'd love to talk about Fury Road. There's another one yeah. coming up. It's going to start shooting next year. Furiosa, Fury right? Called, yeah. So, uh, as I said, the journey continues. So yes. we'll be back to talk some more. Oh yeah, awesome. oh yeah, excited, <laughs> Tony. Look at him; he's going crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, thank all you badasses for watching. Don't forget to follow Richard Norton on Instagram. That's right. Uh, keep in touch, right, with his future projects and endeavors. He is a legend, and don't forget to subscribe to Mr. Tony of the Dead. That's right. If you love action, I'm gonna get some action movies on your. Uh, Action reviews on your channel, Tony. We're gonna, we're gonna. We're, I know you're all about horror, man. We're gonna, we're gonna. You're gonna flip it up, my friend. I'm gonna, I'm gonna entice you to add an extra genre. Let's I'll throw try. some action in there. And if you're new here, uh, like, share, and subscribe. Support the samurai guy. Appreciate all you guys watching. Support the stunt men and the filmmakers that make the magic happen. Spread the word. And uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll have another guest here, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time. And Thursday and maybe Friday, we'll see what's going on. But uh, a lot of fun times, talking movies, showing support to badassity. And we see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you, guys. Love it.